I think everybody already knows our very special guest today, native St. Louis and Harry Weber. Uh, you may not guess that he was a graduate of Princeton University. He is a U.S. Navy veteran and, of course, a world-renowned sculptor and, I believe, a gentleman. <laughs> Harry drove all the way in. He lives beyond Wentzville, so he went beyond the call of duty. He has won major awards in national jury competitions. His work has been on covers of national magazines, and two of his sculptures have been designated national Lewis and Clark sites by the Federal Parks Department. He was selected in a national competition to sculpt a statue of Dred Scott, which now stands at the old courthouse in St. Louis. We are really honored to have you with us, Harry. Thank you very much. I'm going to start off the talk by, uh, it's always good to show a sculpture by somebody else when you're talking about your own. <laughs> That's a sculpture by Rodin, who was my hero from the time I was about as old as he is. Um, I was drawing from the time I was about that high. And I loved two people. Uh, Rodin was one because he could make things move. Uh, that's about 800 pounds of bronze. And at the time it was renowned because he made it move. That was called the walking man or John the Baptist. And if he had had the tools at his disposal that I have, I am amazed what he would have been able to do. Um, I've got things that I can use that he didn't that make my sculptures a lot more easily movable, uh, which is the thing that I love the most. I have always been fascinated with how human beings communicate with one another and how human beings fight the natural processes of living. I mean, every one of you right now, from the time that you were born until the time that you depart this life wherever you're going to go, you are a constant war with gravity. You're being sucked down to the middle of the earth. And how you deal with that is always fascinating to me, particularly with athletes, particularly with people that you know, have to move for a living. Uh, it's how they deal with that fight for gravity. The other thing is how we express ourselves. And uh, yeah, I'm going to have to use this analogy anyway. I'm a big dog lover. You know, when dogs meet, they go around and they sniff each other and see what's going on. Human beings don't have to do that because their faces are exquisite communicators. Whether they're talking or not, you have an absolute wonderfully idea of what they're thinking, uh, how they're reacting to you, you know, what mood they're in. You know, this face has, I think, 672 muscles and it can make a vast number of expressions. So the facial expressions, the movement, the hands, all of those things are what I deal with to try to portray people. And I'm in a business that has not changed much in 2,000 years. You know, we still use the same techniques to make bronze that they did 2,000 years ago. With a few changes, it makes it happily a lot more easy to get it done. Um, what, and first of all, let me tell you, I, I am not a touchy artist. So uh, any question you have at any time, please just blurt it out and let me know. But what I'm going to start with is a 20-minute uh, a movie that should forestall a lot of questions. Because often people ask, how do you make a bronze statue? And it's extraordinarily difficult. Um, in the 19th century, people like Rodin, early 20th centuries, weren't really considered to be artists. They were considered to be artisans because unlike the artist in his garret painting all by himself and is inspired, these guys worked almost 100% on commission, meaning they didn't pick the subject matter. Somebody paid them and they did, represented what was in front of them. The trick was, and I still view this as the major accomplishment if I do it, was somebody assigns me to do a statue of somebody, something, somewhere, and I've got to make art out of it. In other words, it's not just a representation of a human being, it's a piece of artwork. That's the real trick. Uh, and this movie will explain basically how that gets done. The reason they weren't considered to be artists was, number one, commissions, they didn't get to pick their subject matter. 
Number two, it's a team effort. I've been working with the same people for 25 years. We've done about 150, 160 statues together. And it's an amazingly industrially oriented piece. This is my best outfit. Uh, normally, I look like 15 times disheveled. And if you've ever been around a studio where somebody's working to actually make a sculpture or around uh, a foundry, my God, oh, you know, the OSHA is terrified of foundries. They're frightening places. And the welding, everything is dirty, it's dusty, it's messy. It's not at all like artwork. It's really industrial. So if we could play this movie, this may answer a bunch of the questions that you might have later on. I take no responsibility for anything. <laughs> St. Louis and named Jerry Mandel. And he was hired by Stiefel. Um, Stiefel hired me to do a giant bull and bear, which is now down on uh, Broadway in Washington. And this shows it from start to finish. What happens, how you get a commission, how you deal with it, uh, all the way to the end result. And here's the technician. <laughs> And he asked me if I'd be interested in doing it. Oh. oh. That's Bill Bradley, by the way. <laughs> Who would have made a wonderful president?
natural because it's the bear is about you know, the way we're going to do it is about oh 10 foot 6 11 feet tall and unfortunately a spanish fighting bull that we were trying to use as a model for what we were going to do is probably less than four feet of the shoulder maybe you know so we had to enlarge the bull to be about twice life size to be fighting with a bear who was just life size but uh, it made an even fight so we were happy to do that what i found most interesting about the original concept with harry weber was that we wanted the bear and the bull to be in a fight as to who was going to win but you weren't going to know who was going to win that's the whole idea and when i first saw the rendering i know harry won't admit this but it actually the bull was winning i could see that and i mentioned it to harry he of course told me that he had never changed the sculpture for any client but on the spot I change them all the time the inclination of the bear's eyes that made it a fair fight harry you better admit that that's what you did nope eventually we came up with sketches that we kind of liked that seemed to work and we did a two-foot model or a maquette and I uh, tried to solve all the problems with three dimensions in that model so that we could you know, make sure that when we enlarged it uh, it wouldn't take too much modification in sizes that were difficult to deal with uh, and went from there. there is a its own problems and its own challenges and that's what makes them interesting. This one had a unique problem in that it was so large, it was so bulky. So what we did was hire a sign maker who cut out 140 layers of insulation material and stacked them all together you know, in a perfect sequence so that we could load the clay on that. And then the heads, uh, which were sculpted separately because it was a lot easier to sculpt the detail of the heads on stands right in front of me and not sculpting 12 feet in the air. You can see Misha putting the head of the bear on top of his body even before we put it on the gantries. That's what we will use to load the clay on. And before sculpting begins, what we'll do is, uh, first of all, as I said, we put the position of the two exactly the way we wanted. Then we separated them and started loading uh, molten clay onto those forms. Now technically, uh, this was a major job. There was about 500 pounds of clay on this thing. And when you think of the surface area involved in this, every, every single square inch of this had to be worked with hands and tools. It took a long, long time to get the details on it. This is the original art of clay, and there'll still be about four months, five months worth of work to get this into bronze, um, including putting mold making, casting, welding, lots of stuff that is hugely, hugely man hour intensive. I, I deal in realism. I try to make things as emotionally real as possible. Maybe not every single detail, but make sure that the attitude and character of what I'm presenting looks real, looks like it moves, looks like it has life and vitality. Uh, the only thing that's not real about this behind us is I wanted to get a bull that had character itself. And most of the pictures that I got initially were of uh, PBR, you know, uh, bull riders, you know, Brahma bulls which, by the way, are not the world's most attractive animals. And so I went back and tried to get a lot of research done on Spanish fighting bulls. So what you see behind me, the bear itself, is probably only a foot bigger than a real Kodiak bear. But the bull, uh, to make an even fight, I had to take a Spanish fighting bull and blow it up to about twice life size. And by the way, artistic license is something I want to talk about. Looks like this one, bulls and bears. I could change reality. Major criteria. I didn't want to look like anybody else's sculpture. Many people don't realize that St. Louis is the second largest headquarters for financial services companies in the country, second only to New York. The Bear and the Bull 
is symbolic of our industry and we believe uh, is appropriate to be in downtown St. Louis. The first part of making molds is probably the most distressing for some people. I actually enjoy it. Is we cut these things apart. We cut off the arms, we cut off the he heads, we cut off the horns. Uh, this piece will be cast in probably well more than 100 pieces. The pieces are actually 128. My, my shims that are put all the way around the remaining pieces so that you can see how these shims are made out of playing cards. And we use more decks of playing cards than the average casino does in a night, just shimming out these things so we define the various areas where it's going to be molded. These areas are painted with urethane rubber, which will pick up every single detail. If I leave a fingerprint in that clay, it's going to come out of that urethane rubber. Every piece that we cut off and every piece that we left intact will be completely coated in this urethane rubber with the express purpose of all it is going to do is pick up the detail of the surface. This piece was so big and it's so critical that we don't have any warpage in the wax and we don't have any movement. We actually hired a specialist in fiberglass technology to come out and make fiberglass mother molds. During that time, nobody without a mask was allowed into the studio because it's a very toxic operation casting fiberglass. Now, once these fiberglass molds were finished, we took them all off the figure, piece by piece by piece, maybe 120 of them. You can see you know, that it's uh, a pretty tough science of pulling these things apart, getting them off the original art. The original art, after the molds are pulled, the original art has lost its utility. Uh, there's a huge dumpster outside into which the original art will be deposited. And the only thing that will be left will be these molds into which we'll make waxes, and those waxes will be used to make bronze. There you can see the bull's head minus his horns and his ears, uh, because again, they will be individual pieces. And you can see pretty much the thickness from where the horns will go. And the inside is supported so that there is going to be no distortion once they go into the ceramic shell. And uh, all that will be poured in a piece. And what do you imagine that will weigh? Well, I'm holding about 20 pounds, so times 10, yeah. about 200 pounds. Right. Well, we send to the foundry. We send to the foundry pieces of, uh, usually pieces of wax. We sent them the molds in this case, and they pulled the waxes there so there would be no distortion. They, in turn, dipped these in a ceramic shell uh, until there was a big ball of ceramic, pretty much like your coffee cup at home, and then burned out the wax, poured it in silicon bronze at 1200 or 2200 degrees, let it cool, and then hammered off that shell, and what's left is an exact replication of what we sent them in wax, except now it's in metal. Set the ceramic. The 
hotter they get it, the better the bronze pours through it. That's a crucible with 2200 pounds, 2200 degree silicon bronze, which again, something Rodin didn't have. Silicon bronze was brand new, well, over the last 40 years.
the rest of it is just the thing being put in place. And you see the most important man, which you just missed seeing, uh, the guy that signed the paycheck. <laughs> Uh, we can go back to these images. Now you know basically how bronzes are made. And you can see how many people are involved and how messy it is and how each one has different problems that are presented. If you go down to the Drury Plaza Hotel, oh, let's see. Uh, let's start with the first one. Oh, oh I've got my thing here. Okay, uh, if we get to full screen. Where'd the full screen go? No. There we go. Okay, back to Rodin. Rodin had to put this on two points of contact, on a base, because bronze is not a very strong metal, uh, despite what all the Bronze Age warriors said. So that is supported like that. If he had stainless steel, like we showed up there, he could have had that guy running on one toe. Um, That's, uh, I'll go through these really quickly. And again, if you have any questions or want to stop, just yell out, raise your hand, and I'm happy to be interrupted. I love answering questions. That's Bill Bradley up at Princeton. You can see he's about 650 pounds of bronze supported on his left foot. That's Bill Bradley, or excuse me, uh, that's Bobby Orr up in Boston. And uh, he's scoring the winning goal against the St. Louis Blues in 1970. And uh, Noel Picard tripped him and threw him in the air by flipping his skate. And he's still smiling because he knows he's just won the Stanley Cup. <laughs> and that's 1,200 pounds of bronze supported on his right toe, which again, thanks to stainless steel. Uh, that's Daniel Boone out in uh, St. Charles in Main Street. That's a football coach in Tennessee, again, walking on one foot. Uh, this is a statue that was supposed to be at Bush Stadium in 1963. But Mayor Tucker said uh, this was designed by Amity Wolschlager, who used to do the Weatherberg and did a lot of sports drawings. Amity was a character. Uh, he designed this statue for Bush Stadium in 1960. And uh, Mayor Tucker said, no, we can't have two figures. It was too expensive, so he gave it to his friend, Carl Mose, who did that statue of Musial yeah. that's out there in the stadium now, which uh, Amity Wolschlager hated it. Uh, he absolutely detested that statue. And he was found after finishing the first bottle of scotch for the day, which he often did, <laughs> saying, we ought to throw that in the river. <laughs> But this was commissioned by the Missouri Sports Hall of Fame, and that's Amity's design, and I got to do it, which is really a great honor. Uh, Lou Brock at Lou Brock Field out of Lindenwood. Um, Buck O'Neill at Kansas City. Uh, that's working on the uh, statue called The Captain's Return about the uh, Lewis and Clark expedition that's down on the riverfront now. It's up on the North Sullivan Boulevard. That was cast in 198 pieces. And if you can imagine those guys that you saw working, Vlad and Misha. Misha, by the way, died at the very beginning of the Russian invasion. Uh, they were both Ukrainian, and uh, I miss him. He was like a son to me. But uh, when they assemble these statues, it's like assembling a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle where each piece weighs at least 50 pounds. So that's how tough it is. Yeah. Does weather bother bronze? Weather does, uh, atmospherics bother bronze. Um, weather not so much, but if you have acid in the air, which every, every urban that does, it will get in and it'll change the color of it. If you know the Millis Fountain out in front of the, uh, the Union Station, that was absolutely blue for years and years and years because of the acid that attack the service of the bronze. But if you keep it clean and you keep it waxed, yeah, 
it was fine. But if you ever saw it, there was a show called After Man, the premise of which was if human beings disappeared overnight, how long would the things they built last? You know, and it took a very short time, you know, for cities to crumble and disappear. The last thing to go were bronze statues. So it's a big responsibility. <laughs> Uh, that's that's the 22-foot statue of Lewis and Clark down at the Liberfront. And the toughest part of that was dealing with the seven regulatory agencies, federal, municipal, and state, that had to agree with one another, and they all hated each other. So it <laughs> took us two years to get that site. Uh, these are some of the cardinal statues. This one's entirely imaginary. Uh, it's Cool Papa Bell. There is only one picture of Cool Papa Bell, and it's not in action. So I had to imagine what it was like for Cool Papa Bell to be turning third base. Uh, again, Lou Brock. Dizzy Dean, on the other hand, this was done from the very first high-speed camera ever used in a baseball game. And I had nine frames of Dizzy Dean delivering a pitch. Very few people believe that he could make that big a stretch with his legs, but he did. Uh, my favorite, Bob Gibson. And they said, uh, you know, Bob Gibson wants to meet you. He'll probably yell at you, but he does everybody. Don't worry about it. And he's actually very nice. And uh, you know, they said, God, you made him look so mean. And he said, well, you don't look very pleasant when you're delivering a 100 mile an hour fastball at somebody you don't like very much. <laughs> And I never hit anybody that I didn't hit on purpose. Uh, more of the Cardinals, Stan Musial, Your Chainings, Hornsby, Slaughter, uh, Ozzy Smith, to whom I lost several hundred dollars on the golf course. <laughs> and uh, that is Chuck Berry, which is down on the Delmar Loop who had the largest hands of any human being I think I've ever heard. Yeah, he just, uh, he could envelop the entire guitar. You keep going here, come on. There's Chuck. Uh, a bunch of statues down in Texas, that's the country doctor. It's a guy named Dr. Middlebrook. And I worked for a long time on him, and it was, you know, I wanted to have him walking across the street to the hospital cheerily topping his hat, and I had a smile on his face. And his daughter said, well, that looks pretty good, but you gotta get rid of this smile. That son of a bitch never smiled his whole life. <laughs> Another one in Texas, uh, David Francis, out of Francis Park, who was uh, governor, ambassador to Russia, 1917. There he is at Francis Park. This is one of my favorites. Uh, this is a guy named Tony DeMarco. And let me see if I can go ahead a little further. Yeah, that's Doug Flutie. Um, Doug Flutie for Boston. And the athletic department came down for a baseball game at the Cardinals thing and said, we want a statue of uh, Doug Flutie. Who did those? And they called me. And so they said, we want a 12 foot statue of Doug Flutie. So we had just finished it, and you can see I'm sort of putting the head on, if this is all in clay. And right after this picture was taken, I got a call from Father Leahy, who was the president of Boston College, who said, Mr. Weber, I said, yes. This is Father Leahy, president of Boston College. How tall is that statue of Mr. Flutie? And I said, well, the athletic department wanted it 12 feet tall, it's 12 feet tall. Are you aware of how tall the statue of St. Ignatius Loyola might be? <laughs> and I said, no. I said, it's only 10 feet tall. We can't have a football player bigger than the same. You'll have to do it again. So we did it. <laughs> and we took it from 12 feet, oh, come on, boy, down to 8 feet. So he's smaller than a saint, but he's still bigger than Doug Flutie ever was. <laughs> And so anyway, about three days after we got that call, or after we put up Flutie, I got a great call. I was sitting in my studio and said, are you Weber? I said, yeah. My name's Bill Spadafora. I'm chairman of the Italian American Sports Hall of Fame. We've seen your Flutie statue. We liked it. 
we want you should do a statue of Tony DeMarco, world welterweight champion. And I said, that sounds great, I'd love to. So they flew me up to Boston, it was the middle of February, snowing. I got this picked up by this black limousine. It was like an episode of The Sopranos. We pulled into the north side, and, you know, and the guy leans out the window and said, Vinny, park the car. You know, so I walked into this tiny little restaurant. I thought, well, at least you know, I'm safe up here. I said, oh, no, 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 Mr. Weber, we're downstairs. So we went down, and there was a long table full of everybody that was shaped like a fire plug saying, hey, how you doing, how you doing? And uh, in the middle of that, Tony DeMarco, and I, I had looked him up on Wikipedia and said, like all good fighters at the time, I was owned by the mob. And uh, so, but their checks were on time. <laughs> What's that guy standing? Is that Tony DeMarco? That's Tony, Tony DeMarco himself. And he was, uh, I think, when that picture was taken, 84, and completely in possession of his faculties and very, very chipper. Yeah, that's him at age 25. And that's the statue that's on the north side of Boston. Uh, Dick Hauser. Uh, who never moved much, he was a world, you know, but he was climbing up the stairs to the dugout, so that's how we did it. Go through Doug Flutie again. Uh, Dred and Harriet Scott, and again, we wanted to get the emotion of those two people that fate, she was the real hero in the crowd. She didn't have to be there in the first place. She was free and clear, but she decided to go to trial with him. That's kind of a nice shot from the back of the yard. I didn't want to capture the defiance and the pain. This is the one that was uh, done by Charles Drury at the Drury Plaza in uh, 4th Street downtown. And Charles Drury was an irascible character uh, who didn't want us to interrupt the lobby of his hotel, so he built a false wall behind which we had to load 40 tons of rock, 40 tons of water, make molds, make statues, install everything, and then tear down the wall, there it was. So that's in the lobby of the Drury Plaza. Like I said, every project had its own problems. That's York, it was put in later. Um, Bernie Federico for the blues. The other two statues I did not do. And that's kind of illustrative of, you know, when people put up statues, they think, and I can't blame them. You know, if you put up a statue, that's enough. I don't care what it looks like. I'm putting up a statue of this guy, that's an honor. So uh, they didn't want to hire me because it cost too much money, so they hired a trophy guy to do the other two statues out in front of the blues. Um, that's at MICES. Um, so it's to symbolize academics, athletics, and music. Back, uh, that's down in Texas. That's Neftali Felice and Benji Molina, who is uh, Yadi Molina's brother, who is now the Spanish language commentator for the Texas Rangers. Um, we did a lot of religious stuff. This is uh, the Good Samaritan for the Good Samaritan Hospital outside of Chicago. Uh, Hannah Cole uh, is one of my favorites because this is the unofficial mayor of Lynchburg, Tennessee, Herb Fanning. Uh, Jack Daniels wanted to do a statue of him right out in front of their old general store. And that guy, Jack Lucchese, the, the kind of large guy sitting there, he had his arm torn off in an auger as a kid. And uh, Jack Daniels hired him, you know, to be, this was, Jack Daniels was kind of a family operation. And they hired Andy Lucchese to come in and just work how he could. And one day the president of Jack Daniels said, hey, Andy, you're Italian. Go up and talk to some of those Italian friends of yours in Chicago, see if we can sell some Jack Daniels. And he went up and he saw Frank Sinatra put a bottle on the, put a bottle on the piano, and the rest is history. And that was uh, one of the great marketing coups of all time. That's down in Florida. The guy that commissioned that, when he commissioned it, he was a, it's a high school, a high school in Florida, in Fort Walton Beach. And that high school stadium seats 25,000 people. 
I was in high school. And I went down there to install that thing, and I saw there's all these guys out there that looked like Man Mountain Dean bashing at each other. And I said, God Almighty, those high school football players? They said, Yeah, it's the freshman team. <laughs> Oops, wrong one, wrong one for you. Uh, Jackie Stiles, uh, Kaufman's. Oh, that's. Uh, that's outside Lester's restaurant in Ladue. That's Stan Musial. Nice story about that is how do you get work? I got a call in the middle of working on something else and uh, they said, my name is Lester Miller. He said, can I come see you? I said, sure. He pulled up, you know, I, I live at the end of a mile and a half gravel driveway. And he pulled up and it was like a clown car from the circus and all these guys got out. <laughs> Came in, I was working on something and he looked at me and said, how much for one of those? <laughs> and I said, well, that one's sex and so. He said, I want a statue of Musial for my restaurant. Uh, and I, he wrote a check uh, on the spot. And my wife had been in the kitchen um, and he drove off. I was sitting there with his check. <laughs> and I said, guess who just came to dinner? <laughs> so that, that's the way that statue got made. Come on, guys. Never been really good. This is in China. That's uh, Adam Wainwright. And uh, we are a sister city to Nanjing, China. Nanjing, China wanted something typically St. Louis. So we said, what could be more St. Louis than a St. Louis Cardinal baseball player? So he is pitching from Nanjing, China. And there's a Chinese national baseball player at Ballpark Village about to hit the pitch. We're about to try to get the pitch. Uh, Norm Stewart. Norm Stewart, nine feet tall outside the basketball stadium. Norm Stewart, seven feet tall. Payne Stewart. <laughs> and uh, this is the statue in Africa of uh, Pele. Uh, and that guy to the, to the just to the right is uh, Alibango Ondimwa, who, after this statue was up for several years, got deposed. He was got in real trouble, so I don't think he's any longer the president of Gabon. Come on. Uh, firefighters. That dog was actually at Ground Zero in 2001. St. Philippine de Shane, that's up in uh, Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, that's a statue of Albert Pujols that was put up just before he left town. He looked at that statue, he loved it, and four days later he went to Los Angeles. Uh, that is, uh, uh, who was that? Castellani, Rocky Castellani who was one of the few guys to beat Tony DeMarco, and he's up outside Pittsburgh. There he is. Uh, that's a private commission. I get very few of those. Nobody will see this. This is in somebody's backyard who wanted to honor their dog with a statue of St. Francis. So that's St. Francis and their dog. That's the bull and bear you saw. That's the cardinal thing. This is one of the few times that a commission came that they said, I don't care what you do, you know, just make it and put it up. That was the Central West End Association wanted a statue of Tennessee Williams. And I'm a big fan of acting in theater, and so I did Tennessee Williams half drunk, cross-eyed with a cigarette in his hand. <laughs> That's down in Texas, Texas Revolutionary. Back down in Musial. This is also in Texas. Uh, four actual Texas storytellers. This was a tough one because everybody that knew them, their wives, their daughters, their kid, were still alive. And so we had to have four approvals on the faces and the attitudes of these guys. And they have recordings of them. They're Texas storytellers and they're fascinating. Uh, that's done in cast marble. That's Mater Admirabilis. And that's at a Stonebridge School in Bethesda. 
There's Wainwright being made. Here's a preview. Six years from now, that statue of Pujols will be up in front of Bush Stadium. Six years from now, that statue of Yachty will be up in front of Bush Stadium. And uh, they hired me to do those now because they were sure they were going into the Hall of Fame. They were not sure I would be alive to do them. <laughs> so if anybody had, that's about it. If you have any questions, yeah. Do you do your work on a cost plus or fixed price? And then the other question is, the bull and bear, how much did that cost? Uh, the bull and bear was close to a half a million dollars. And, and, if you, and if you get some idea from the movie where that half a million dollars goes. Uh, in particular, just the cost of the metal, the cost of the bronze. Uh, cast silicon bronze from an art foundry costs now $28 a cast pound. That statue weighed 9,000 pounds. So multiply 9,000 by 28, and that's just the cost of the metal. That's not paying me, that's not paying everybody else. But the first question, yes, fixed price. We, we hit it sometimes, we lose it sometimes, but it comes out. But in my previous life where I had, as my mother said, a real job, um, I was aware that the one thing people hated was being niggled and dying to death. And so we said, this is what it's going to cost. That's going to include my travel, communications, everything. I don't care what it is. You know, you pay three times, once at the beginning, once at the original art, and once at installation, and that's it. And they seem to appreciate that. So it helps. Yeah. What was your most recent job? How long ago? Is it one of those sports well, figures? Well, uh, we, we finished Pujols and Molina just now. And uh, we are currently working on six other projects. Um, one of them is a giant bear for the Boston Bruins. Um, and then a couple of war memorials that involve four or five figures. So you're not retired? I'm not retired, no, no, no. Uh, Lovedens will retire me. <laughs> <laughs> Where do your employees come from? Are they students that come into you, art students, or? Oh, no, no. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first time in years I've got a, an art student working for me now. And uh, we're doing, uh, I don't know if it's a secret or not. We're doing a statue of a famous St. Louis, and, but uh, I'm having her help me with that. But usually, no, I, I work with the same people for 25 years. The ones that you saw on that movie were the ones I've worked with. So you never hire anybody new and teach them? And I've tried a couple of times, and it's, it's one of those things that, you know, it, uh, I, I have a, a particular style, and you, you can't, you know, it's, it's hard to do. Uh, and we work, we are so lucky that we get so much work that we can't just play around with it. It has to get up and done. And most clients are unaware of how long it takes to do something. Like that statue of Bobby Orr, they wanted it in five months, which was just extraordinary. Uh, and yeah, we put a price tag on that. Uh, to get it done in five months. Any, anybody else? Is, is there a, uh, Matt, in one of your uh, rough sketches here in St. Louis that we could follow up the We used to have a map on my website, but it got kind of crowded. Um, there are 35 sites in and around St. Louis with 64 statues in them. And then we've got 100 scattered around the rest of the country. And uh, thanks to Adam Wayne, we have one in China now. <laughs> yeah. Didn't you do one of uh, Mary for Cassie Catholic Church just outside Laurie? No. Outside Barnes? No. Laurie, Missouri. Laurie Catholic Church. And there's no, no, I didn't. I'm sorry. I thought you had done that one. No, it's uh, fortunately there are a lot of good sculptors and, you know, and also, fortunately, we all get along. Yeah, we're, we're very happy with one another. Don Weekend's one of my best friends, and there are a lot of folks that do what I do. But uh, we, it, it's a question of style. And the nice thing is, you put up a sculpture, it's like putting up a billboard. And people know exactly what they're going to get, because 
they can see representations of it. So it's like being an architect and building a building. Yeah. yeah. How long did it take you to do the bare and from start to finish? Um, from start to finish, that was about 14 months. Have okay. you just do one project at a time? Or no, no, we do several at a time, we hope. Um, because the one thing I've learned is the most important five minutes of my life are the first five minutes I go to the studio in the morning. Because I can see what I did yesterday with fresh eyes. And, you know, and I can see all the mistakes I made and all the, the horrors that I've done. You tend to hypnotize yourself when you work on something, you know, for hours and hours. And you tend to convince yourself, hey, that's great. Until you look at it the next morning and go, ah. So it's good to hop from one to the other. And they're all at different stages. Some are in sketches, some are in clay, some are in casting. You know, it's, they, they're moving right through. Yeah. Did you already say, how many pieces have you done in your lifetime? Or did you tell me? Well, the oh, big ones, uh, about 160. Big ones and small ones, 500, 600. I don't know. What's little? What's little? Huh? How little is little? Little is about, uh, the, the littlest is six inches, <laughs> but mostly the desktop pieces are 18 inches, two feet. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. I'm sure that many of us here have seen the girls in the, in the garden, running in the garden. Yeah, that's Don Weekend. Oh, I thought that was yours. No, no, that was Don. Um, that's the Donnelly girls, I think. And uh, yeah, Don did a great job on those. Yes, about the uh, welding of the bronze, do you have any testing happened to verify, to verify the testing, the uh, process in the parts of welding property together? I, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Part. Do, you, do you have a testing of, do you have testing of the welding of the parts together? Because you have all these parts, you're welding bronze, yeah. And then and you have a special electrode, right? Well, we just, it's just with a brazing rod. You know, just, just like welding with a brazing rod. And then we, as uh, Misha said, Misha, who is now unfortunately departed, we weld it from both sides and then chase out the welds. Oh, okay. So if, if you uh, go to the stadium, each one of those things outside the stadium were cast in at least a dozen pieces. And I, I defy you to find a weld. You know, you, you won't be able to find one. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, were you surprised to get the award? Um, I was flabbergasted, yeah. I mean, and, uh, in my speech I met it. It's, it's very ironic for my job is honoring people. So I was being honored for honoring people. Yeah. <laughs> Go figure. Yeah. And uh, they don't make any statues of dull people. So it's been, it's a really interesting job. You get to meet a lot of fascinating folks. Yeah. Drawn your whole life and yeah. Yeah. Every every, every day. Uh, I lost the, the biggest loss I ever had was I did probably 200 sketches when I was in Vietnam, oh. and I lost about all but 20 of them. Oh. And, uh, Where did you actually learn this sculpture? Uh, a lot of trial and error, um, but if you think about it. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a representational artist, so in drawing and painting, which I did a lot of, you're taking a three-dimensional subject, transferring it to a two-dimensional surface, and making it look three-dimensional. In sculpture, you just skip a step. You're taking a three-dimensional object and making it three-dimensional. What could be easier? So, uh, <laughs> Oh, some books, some talking, some just, just playing around. Uh, there was, uh, I said Rodin was one of my heroes, another guy named Howard Brody, who was a sketch artist. And you may have seen him, you know, I know, I know I'm know. i old enough, so I'm probably most of you are old enough, uh, to remember the Patty Hearst trial. And the sketchbook, the sketch artist that did that for NBC, that was Howard Brody. 
He also did a whole bunch of sketches in World War II and Korea and uh, on Vietnam. And he was a brilliant artist, just fabulous. I love the guy. And uh, he and I talked for hours about how, you know, you make things come alive with bold strokes. You don't overwork it to the point that it dies. Uh, I'm, I'm not a, a fan of sculpture that is absolutely exact. I like to see the artist's thumbs and fingers in it. So uh, anyway, Howard Brody and I agreed on that. Yeah? How large is your studio? Studio is not all that big. It's only about 20 by 30, but I don't need that much. You know, a life-size figure just sits there and I can, can do that. When we get something like the Bear for Boston, we're, I'm, I'm renting a space at Chesterfield Mall which they're tearing down in July, but I only need it for six months, so I'm gonna do it in there. So we, you know, if, if we need, need something big, we'll do it. Otherwise, I like having a 15-foot commute to work. I just leave breakfast and go right to the studio. <laughs> yeah. Are you a veteran? I am a veteran, yeah. Um, I was uh, six years in the Navy, and I was on river patrol boats in Vietnam you know, by the Cambodian border. So, anyway, yeah? What was your age when you did your first, first sculpture? The what now? What was your age when you did your first oh, sculpture? Oh, good, good question. Because as, my, as, you know, back to my mother saying I had a real job, uh, I did not produce my first sculpture until 1977. Oh, and um, then I did a couple of desktop pieces in 77, got them, um, on consignment in a gallery in New York. Three days later, the gallery was robbed and uh, my statues were stolen with a bonheur and a men. Oh. <laughs> that was great. And the insurance money is better to sale. So <laughs> that, that, that kicked off my career. Uh, so I sold, my wife and I are both big, well, horseback riders. We managed the Bridal Spur Hunt Club, 50 foxhounds and all that kind of stuff and we're steeplechase jockeys. So I, a lot of the early work I did was horses and hounds and things like that, and sold those. Then eventually I got commissions to do some war memorials and other things, but that's it. What about sculpture versus statue? Will a sculpture become a statue or? What's that Sculpts when you do a sculpture. A sculpture? Yeah, and then you have a statue of that later? Oh, yeah, you mean totally, like a small maquette? Yeah, or are they totally different? No, they're, they're the same. and They're more the same now than they used to be. We used to start out making detailed maquettes, little models. Then we do the big one. Now uh, we do a very, very rough model just so that we can get an enlargement enough for a, an armature that I can load clay on. Then we scan the finished sculpture with a laser and we digitize that information and we make a 3D print, however large anybody wants it. So a copy of the larger sculpture. And that's all electronic, I don't have anything to do with it. Great. So I think uh, unless anybody has a burning question, we have really, really enjoyed and been informed by your talk. Thank you. Thank you.